Hey guys, welcome to Code Decode. In this video, we will be looking into mostly asked Spring Boot interview questions for three plus years of experience people. So let's get started and look at these interview questions. Please like, share and subscribe to support us so that this video reaches to more of the people who are preparing for interviews like you. What is the difference between Spring Boot and Spring Framework? So this is a very basic question to just to check the knowledge on how well versed you are with the basics of Spring Framework. So Spring Boot is a framework that simplifies the development of Spring based applications. Remember, Spring Boot is created over Spring. It was difficult to create and develop an end to end application with Spring Framework. Hence, Spring Boot came into picture to reduce the time to market. The Spring Boot provides a number of features that makes it easier to create standalone production ready applications. And what are those features that enable Spring Boot to be able to do that? The features are auto configuration. In Spring Framework, either through Java based configuration or through XML based configuration, you have to explicitly define which bean to create and how to create and where to create. In Spring Boot, it automatically does it with one single annotation. So Spring Boot automatically configures many of these Spring features that you would typically need to configure manually. Secondly is the starter dependencies. Spring Boot provides some starter dependencies. Like for example, for Spring Security, just add one single Spring Security dependency, starter dependency in POM and yes, you have implemented security successfully. You will see a login page who will not allow you to log in without a proper ID password. So that's the beauty of standard dependencies that Spring Boot have, Spring doesn't. Embedded servers, Spring Boot also provides embedded servers such as Tomcat and Jetty so that you don't have to explicitly configure a separate web server. That comes to you as a package. Then you have multiple metrices and health checks which helps you to check the health and metrices of your Spring Boot application in production and monitor your application in production which is not available and possible in Spring Framework standalone. So Spring Boot, as I told you, is built on the top of Spring Framework, but it takes a different approach of development. So development in Spring is difficult, while in the case of Spring Boot, it is very easy because it is opinionated. That means Spring Boot who put some assumptions as to how you want to develop your applications and for basic default configuration, everything will be done by Spring Boot itself. So it is not easier to get started with Spring Boot, but the problem is since it assumes a lot, it creates a lot of default configurations. Your flexibility is very much limited. If you want to have your application completely in your hand in control, go for Spring Framework. If you're okay with Spring Boot taking some catch hold of your default configuration, then go for Spring Boot. So this is a very short summary of difference between Spring Boot and Spring Framework. Opinionated means to give you a custom default configuration. So Spring Boot does it, Spring doesn't. It allows you to have a complete control while in case of Spring Boot, it doesn't. It gives you maximum things automatically configured as a default configuration in your application. Auto configuration is possible in Spring Boot, not in Spring Framework. Starter dependencies are not in Spring Framework, you have it in Spring Boot. Embedded servers like Tomcat Jetty is available in Spring Boot, not in Spring Framework. You have to explicitly do it. Metrices and health checks are automatically given as an actuator endpoint with Spring Boot, which is not there in the Spring Framework. But the only flexibility you have is you have more flexibility and more control over your application in Spring Framework, but lesser in Spring Boot. So the only disadvantage I can find in Spring Boot is the less of flexibility because most of the things are done by Spring Boot. You have less to do, though you can customize it later on with properties file and all, but still much of the things are assumed and opinionated by Spring Boot and you don't have much left on those default configuration. That is why Spring Boot is less flexible. Also Spring Boot focuses on convention over configuration with Spring Framework. You will keep on doing some configuration with XML files, with Java configuration files. What Spring Boot says is, I'm, I'm much over to this configuration. I'll give you the maximum configuration by doing it myself. You don't have to explicitly do anything. So it minimizes the need for explicit configuration and reduces the overall configuration efforts. While on the other hand, Spring Framework requires a lot more of explicit configuration 
to either XML or Java based configuration files. So that's the biggest advantage I find with Spring Boot. Now in general Spring Boot is good choice for developers who want to get started with Spring quickly and easily. But if you need more flexibility, then you should use the Spring Framework directly. Remember Spring Boot is over and above Spring Framework only. So rather than going one level up, if you need more flexibility, go one level down and do every configuration, every headache yourself or else give that task to Spring Boot and be have your time to market very less. So it reduces a configuration overhead and improves your productivity. You don't have to ha put your head into how to manage versions, dependency management. You don't have to do anything. Spring Boot handles it for you so you can focus on your development work and increase your productivity in the project rather than thinking about XML based configurations in Spring Framework. Now, how would you configure a database connection in Spring Boot? So it says that, okay, you are developing an application in Spring Boot. Great. Wow. But now how will you connect this application to database? Because at the end, you have to get some data from database, add some data, do CRUD operations on database, right? So what are the ways to configure a database connection in Spring Boot? There are typically two ways to do it using application.properties file configure your data source and using at the rate configuration class that is a Java class annotated with at the rate configuration which says that I am going to be the source of bean for you for the entire life cycle of your application. All I have is the bean created inside me. So you can use that and create the bean in spring container. So these are the two ways and to create a database connection you need to configure the data source. The only thing that these two methods do is to configure your database. I'll give you one quick example. If you can see here, this is an example of doing it through properties file. So what we have done is we have given a property as spring data source, URL, ID, password, username, driver, class name, all these things. So here with the application dot properties file, the most common way is this. What I have shown you, this is the most common way. With this, what happens is you don't have to change anything in the Java class. You just change your properties and you're good to go. You don't have to modify anything in the source code. It's just the properties that you need to change in case later on the URL username or password changes for any of the database. So this is the most common way to configure a database connection. You specify the connection properties. So these are the connection properties in the application.properties or application.yaml file and Spring Boot will automatically configure the database connection. So using this, that's why I say Spring Boot is smart enough. What it will do is it will automatically configure the data source because it sees that, okay, Spring data source, you have given a URL. It understands that you want to connect to localhost 3306 restaurant database with this username and password and will configure that. So whatever CRUD operations you do the entire application, it will be done saved in this restaurant db okay. The second way is at the rate configuration class. This is more advanced way to configure the database, but I never suggest this. The reason being here, if in case by any chance your username changes or your password is corrupt or compromised, you change the password, then you have to go into the Java class and modify the source code. I do not ever appreciate that. I always suggest that such things which can modify later time in the life cycle of an application, keep it in properties file so that it is easily configurable through properties and you don't have to change anything in the source code. So how do you do that? Still just for knowledge, how would you do that? You can use at the rate configuration class. I'll tell you how. So you can give a class name as database configuration or anything what you even XYZ will work. Just mark it as at the rate configuration, which will say that, okay, I'm a class who is going to provide you beans. So scan me and create bean in spring container. The next is you have to create the bean because it is a configuration class. The task is to create the bean. So now create a bean for data source. If you can see here, this is again a data source. So either you do it this way or you do it this way. Both are going to configure your data source. So here you create a data source builder and pass the URL username password like I have done it here. URL username password and internally rather than using its default data source Spring Boot will use your customized data source and will do all the CRUD operation on this my database. So that's why I say that if data source is to be modified 
you have to put your own customized data source b then then go with this this method or with this properties file method so this we have already seen now once you have configured your database connection you can use it in your spring boot application using hibernate jpa so as i have told you data source is something which is an existing vlan spring boot but since you want to modify it and use your own database you have customized it using by by giving it your own url username and password so now you can use this particular data source with any of the orm framework or even with simple jdbc template and writing a sql query everything will work upon this restaurant db database only now a question which almost every interviewer ask you what is the purpose of adderit spring boot application annotation so here if you can see the main class is annotated with adderit spring boot application what does this mean this particular annotation is a combination of three important annotations component scan enable auto configuration and configuration so let's go from the bottom side configuration says as told in the previous slide itself at the rate configuration says that i am going to be a java class who will provide you beans definition now you'll ask me this is the class start this is the class end where are the beans where do you define beans so if it is annotated at the rate configuration class means for sure it is the root class for providing beans it doesn't mean this is a class to provide bean it says i am the root class which provides you the bean for your spring container to create and manage so what does that mean it's a root class it means that there is also called as component scan which is a part of this if you can see here there is a component scan so this annotation says that spring boot if you want beans please scan the current package and all its sub packages in order to identify the annotated class and configure them as a spring bean and spring container so what this component scan says it says that this annotation is given to the root class at the root package if you can see the root package is com code decode restorant listing and all the other packages you can see are the sub packages of this package only and this package contains only one main class which is annotated with at the rate spring boot application so with this structure spring container understands that i have not only to scan com code decode restorant listing but also i have to scan all the base packages that is i have to scan com code decode restaurant listing controller dto entity mapper repository service and search for any of the class which is annotated with either of the adderit component adderit service adderit repository adderit entity and create the beans out of all of these annotated classes and keep it with me with the and also manage the life cycle of these beans so that is why at the right component scan says i am going to scan you as a base package and all of your sub packages that is why not even having a single bean in this class still make sure that all the entities dtos mappers repository service controller have their proper beans created in spring container because this annotation is always put at root element and lastly you said that okay i am going to give you beans with at the rate configuration you said okay if i am not able to give you beans scan each and every of my sub packages for sure you will get every bean you said okay great but now who will tell you that auto configure this bean in spring container so that's enable auto configuration so enable auto configuration spring boot auto configures that means it creates the bean automatically by scanning the class path so as soon as you scan the current packages whose task is to automatically create the bean out of it and keep it in spring container for further use is the task of enable auto configuration so that is why adderit spring boot application which you see is three simple words does a lot of things for your application what it does it allows you to create configurations or beans for your application by scanning the class path and all its child sub packages and configure them as spring beans automatically based on the dependencies that are present on the class path so at the rate configuration at the rate component scan and at the rate enable auto configuration three together make sure that this application file which is annotated with this or which is a root class and the root package will have all its base classes 
and sub classes scan they are being created and that to automatically you don't have to do any manual intervention into it so this makes very easy to create spring boot application as you don't have to explicitly configure the beans that are needed it saves lot of your time and efforts and it makes your application portable remember when we used to develop an application with spring framework we don't have we didn't had spring boot at that time what we used to do we used to add the jars required classes everything in the build path and make sure that our code compiles successfully even we used to manage their versions also simultaneously which was a very tedious task hence spring boot automatically configures everything scans the class path and when you run your application it will start up and ready to use with all the beans created successfully in the spring container now very important part in spring boot how do you manage cache how do you implement cache to implement cache in spring boot you have one pom.xml file add the starter cache dependency of spring boot itself in the application as soon as you do that you will have one of the annotation at the rate enable caching available to you you can use this annotation on the main class spring boot application root class so when you annotate this with at the rate enable which i won't get it because i don't have the pom.xml updated with the starter cache if you need to have the live demo on how to implement spring boot starter cache just let me know in the comment section i have many questions to cover so i'll quickly go through this now the next thing that you need to do is to enable caching on your main or the root application and as soon as you do that you can also configure the cache manager by default you don't need to do it because spring boot provides you a default cache manager but even you are not happy with the default configurations of cache manager spring boot gives you the capability to configure it or customize it so you can define a custom cache manager how would you do that you can just annotate a class with at the rate configuration and provide a bean of cache manager i told you spring boot gives maximum things as the default one but if you don't want to use it you can always customize it so what you need to do is just give a cache manager bean after customizing here after giving a code here so to use the default cache manager you don't have to do anything however if you want to define your custom cache manager create a bean of type cache manager in your configuration class and spring boot will ignore its default cache manager and will use the cache manager that you have defined as the bean in the configuration class with the custom properties so what till now you have done you have implemented a starter dependency of cache in pom you have enabled caching in your whole application you have given your own cache manager if needed the last thing is to use the use it that is to put the things into your cache and to retrieve things from the cache so how will you get and put things to the cache you have multiple methods like at the rate cacheable at the rate cache put at the rate cache evict methods these will enable caching for a specific method so suppose this is your service you are getting some data from the database now you want to cache it so what you will do is you will annotate that method with at the rate cacheable and give the cache name say employee cache so whenever you get the data of employee from database and you are returning it before that spring boot automatically will create that entry in cache with that key so i'm going to get the data for employee id 1 so automatically you are getting the data out of database for the first time but second time when you try to get the data again for employee id 1 database will not be hit it will be fetched from cacheable it will be hit it will be fetched from the cache your cache that is employee cache so that's how you make use of caching to get the data in quick and effective manner and you don't have to hit the database again and again also you have multiple things like time to live eviction policy and many such thing you can configure here in the spring boot itself with the either the properties file or with configurations so it makes sure that subsequent invocation to get employee with id 1 will not be fetched from database but from your cache employee cache so additionally you can also configure time to live eviction policy cache name and all those things in the properties itself so that was all about how to implement cache in spring boot now can you explain different types of caching mechanism so we have several different types of caching mechanism available in spring boot and the common ones are in memory cache remember 
this is the default cache implementation given by Spring Boot to you. That is in memory cache using concurrent hash map. This is a very basic caching mechanism you can use in your application where the cache data is stored in the mem memory itself. So if the data is in memory, it allows you for faster access and retrieval. And this type of caching is suitable for applications where cache data is not expected to change frequently. Otherwise, you have to go and change the concurrent hash map implementation again and again in memory. And also, if you have a very small set of data, go for in-memory caching because all the data is stored in the memory and memory is limited, you know that. So always you should go for such where your data can fit in the given memory and your memory doesn't go out of space. This is not a very practical solution. I will never suggest in-memory caching for any production based use. If you want to test something, go for it, but not for the production based applications. So in memory cache is given by default by Spring Boot to you, but it's not a very practical solution. The second is distributed caching. This is something you, you always work with in the real time projects because you have multiple environments and multiple regions. So basically your application when deployed through cloud also, involves a distributed environment where your data is present. So distributed caching allows you to store the data across multiple nodes in a distributed environment. Thus it allows you for scaling the caching capacity and provides the high availability. Now a very good example of such caching frameworks are Redis and Hazelcast. The third is external caching. External caching involves external cache service. For example, I'll give you if you're using Hibernate, we have implemented EH cache using Hibernate. That EH cache is actually an external caching mechanism where you use EH cache which seamlessly gets integrated with your Spring Boot application. So it's the beauty of Spring Boot application who provides you endpoints to be able to seamlessly integrated with such external caching mechanism if you do not want to use the default hash map based Spring Boot cache mechanism. So mean cache and EH cache are those such external examples of cache and these services provide dedicated caching capabilities that can be integrated with Spring Boot application. The third one is page caching. The page caching involves the caching of entire HTML page of a website or a web application. Remember when you hit the Wikipedia, when you hit that page again and again, remember that page is a static content. Now, when you every time go and hit that website, you doesn't always get the data from the database or data source. You might get the data from cache also because Wikipedia knows that the content they provide are static. That means they are rarely there in any chance that they are going to change. They are going to be mostly static over the whole lifespan of that particular web page. Thus, for static content who doesn't change frequently, you can always cache the whole entire page and make it available to the people who are trying to access it again and again to increase the performance and to reduce the database or data source hits. So Spring Boot application also supports such paging cache through interaction with web servers like HTTP servers or Nginx. So page caching is only feasible when you have a lot of static data like Wikipedia. The last and the one which you will always come across in your Spring Boot application lifecycle is query caching. Whenever you hit a database with a query, the query is itself cached. The query caching is used to cache the query cache. The query caching is used to cache the result of DB queries. So suppose I am expecting find all employees. Now it hits the database. It takes a lot of time to fetch all the information of all the database and give it back to you. You can always cache this result of find all, which significantly improves, improves the performance of your database heavy applications. So Spring Boot integrates with ORM framework like Hibernate JPL to provide query caching capability out of box. So you might have heard about multiple type of caching we have done in the previous videos with Hibernate. There we have used EH cache, there we have used query cache. All of those caches are extremely important when it comes to real-time IT projects. So querying cache is used to cache the result of a data, particular database query. 
if you have queried something and that query is cacheable the result is cached and next time you hit the same query you get the data from cache and you don't have to hit the database thereby increases the performance and lead time of the project of the database now what is the significance of at the rate auto wired annotation in spring boot the at the rate auto wired annotation is used to automatically inject the dependency and it is a very key component of inversion of control principle on which spring boot is built upon suppose there is a car class and there is an engine class now car needs an engine so you inject the dependency of engine in car that's dependency injection you don't create it with new keyword you rather inject its dependency both are loosely coupled car can exist on its own engine can exist on its own whenever a car needs an engine you can inject its dependency and car can use engine to work appropriately so that's automatic resolution and injection of engine dependency into car de car class so it simplifies the wiring dependencies between car and engine and instead of manually injecting or instantiating engine in car with a new keyword and looking up for dependencies spring boot automatically takes care of resolving and injecting the engine dependency at run time for the car class so your code becomes much more cleaner and maintainable you achieve loose coupling they both can exist on its own and the dependencies for both car and engine are managed by spring container rather than hard coding everything in the code base so it makes your code more mo modular easily testable and promotes the better separation of concern making them stand alone so auto wiring is the one which supports the concept of dependency injection that is injecting the dependency of one component to another or injecting the dependency in our case of engine into car so it allows for easy swapping of dependencies and promotes code reusability it enables you to easily switch implementation or mock the dependencies you during unit testing remember this is very important part when you are unit testing if you have created any class with a new keyword mocking that new keyword instance is becomes next to impossible with simple mock it up but if you have auto wired it you can easily mock it using at the rate mock using mock it up for j unit test cases so whenever you go for a spring boot application having multiple classes having dependency on each other go for at the rate auto wire annotation always rather than creating anything with a new keyword otherwise your unit testing will make your life hell If you want an easy unit test caseable decode always go for at the rate auto wiring making your code loosely coupled so that the dependencies can be easily removed and mocked when whenever unit testing has to be done for that particular class so whenever an interviewer ask you the real advantage that you have faced with auto wiring always tell them that unit test cases are possible in spring boot only because we had at the rate auto wired annotation if we would not have that mocking of this class without auto wiring and doing with a new keyword would have been a difficult task would have been a nightmare for developers like us so at the rate auto wired actually helped us the developers in making the code unit testable and maintainable for the whole life of the application so that's the significance of auto wired in spring boot application now again they might ask you how did you handle exceptions in your spring boot application so there are multiple approaches to handle the exceptions the global exception handling can also be done for the common exceptions like for example if you are facing null pointer exception you can always use the global exception handling where you have a controller advice which is the class based annotation an exception handler which is a method based annotation you can create a global exception handler using at the rate controller device on a class inside the class you can define methods which are annotated with at the rate exception handler to provide specific exception handling like for example null pointer exception can be handled using exception handler this method provide you the custom logic for handling exception so rather than giving 500 internal server error null pointer exception which your client will not be able to understand you could have said that you forgot to pass some mandatory fields because of which the null pointer exception has occurred please try sending a proper request so that we don't face null pointer exceptions in the future request something meaningful you can send from here to your client so rather than 
giving any 500 internal server error and making the client think what went wrong you can actually give some very specific reason why null pointer have occurred and return a sp proper specific HTTP response redirect them to proper error page and log the exception details so that it is better for you to understand what went wrong when customer comes to you and say that they are getting a white label page. The second way of handling custom uh, of handling the exceptions is a custom exception handling where you can have your own custom exceptions like suppose the person has given an age greater than 100 or less than 0 then you can create an exception class called as age exception where that class will extend the runtime exception or exception class and then you can handle it using try and catch so whenever the person passes you the age less than 0 or greater than 100 you can always throw the age exception and catch it and give a proper appropriate exception to the customer saying your age that you have passed is greater than 100 or less than 0 also you can catch these exceptions and help handle them in appropriate exception handlers using try and catch block so these are the three ways the global exception handling is something which is global to the whole application. So whenever in any of the class null pointer exception comes, global exception handler will catch it. A custom exception handling is somewhat much more related to a class based exception handling where you want to send some class specific exceptions like for example your service layer will always throw service exception, your repository layer will always throw repository or SQL exception. So the class based or scenario based exception handling is custom exception handling and the global exception handling is done by controller advice and exception handler. So these are two ways in which you can manage your exceptions in the Spring Boot application. And always try catch will always be there to prevent you from any such 500 internal server error types white labels for your clients. Now if you are giving a Spring Boot interview. 110% sure they'll ask you about profiling in Spring Boot. This is one of the most common questions we have always faced in each and every Spring Boot interview questions. So explain the concept of profiles and how do you use them. Now I'll give you an example first. Suppose I am using MySQL database or relational database for my CRUD operations on my data. Now since production environment is used by my real clients, I'm using AWS relational DBs which is very costly because for each and every request you give to AWS DB it will cost you something like for RDS suppose I'm using relational DB RDS each and every hit to that database is very costly to me now suppose you have a team of 10 people who are developing this application now for testing purpose what they will do is they will keep on adding the data keep on retrieving the data will do all the CRUD operation, will put hundreds of queries to your database. Your billing amount for that RDS in AWS will reach a lot in dollars, which is not required, right? In local for testing, you could have used your in-memory DB or you could have used your local SQL. Why to connect with AWS RDS and corrupt the data of production also? Now suppose while working, they have connected to production DB added data, some deleted data, updated some wrong data. Your customers, real customers are going to face problem. So you understand that we need different properties for different environments. If you are testing and developing and you are in local, all the three can have a local DB. But if you are in production or the QA has to test it, they might have the different database. So this clearly makes sense to have different configurations for different environments so that you can customize the behavior of your application based on the specific profile that to it the runtime so at runtime if you are working locally or on development or testing you can do the database operations in your local db not necessary to go always go on aws rds production db so different set of configurations and beans are required for different various environments like development environment, test environment, production environment, then profiles are very useful. So how does profiling works? I'll give you an example. Here you can see I have application.yaml file. I have application development.yaml file. I have application local.yaml file. But what I can do is 
I can also have application test.yaml file, application dash prod.yaml file. So you have four environments, development, local, test and prod. So n number of profiles you can create here. And if you can see a difference in development environment, I have given the Eureka service URL as Eureka 0 for a cluster in AWS. But my Eureka's URL is local host for my local. So this is how you can differentiate the URLs for the same Eureka in different environments because dev I'm going to connect with AWS. AWS is going to have a cluster, EKS cluster where Eureka will be deployed. In that case, a different Eureka URL will be required to connect all your applications to Eureka successfully. So this is how you give the local connection to local YAML and the cluster connection to Eureka which is deployed for production or development. So very first thing that you need to do is you can define profile specific configuration. So profile specific configuration like for example application dev.yaml, application local.yaml, application prod.yaml. So what Spring Boot do is it automatically loads the properties from the active profile. Now how do you make sure that which profile is active for you? So here in the application.yaml, this is how you tell which profile is active. So currently I say dev is active. That means application dev will, dev will automatically be picked up for properties to be configured by Spring Boot for your Spring Boot application. So profiles can be defined in properties file or YAML file using Spring Profiles Active. So Spring Profiles Active. So suppose Spring Profiles Active is set to dev. That means you are going to work with the development environment. You can also have multiple profiles here like dev, local. So both can be picked up and the one which is the last one will have the precedence if both have the common ones. So here the local property can be picked up. Next, how will you pick which profile which profile has to be picked up? That is conditional based bean registration. You can conditionally register beans based on the active profile. So if you annotate a bean with at the rate profile test, that bean will only be available during unit testing or testing that you are doing. Suppose, for example, I have an entity, restaurant, but I'm just using it for testing purpose. So I could have used at the rate profile like this and give it as test as a profile. So until unless the profile of test is not active, restaurant entity will not be created and registered in the spring container and will be used. Or for all the other profiles, you will get bean creation exception. The bean for restaurant is not found because you have given a property that it should be available only in the test environment. And in the application dot properties, you have given dev as the current environment. So remember, judiciously use this at the rate profile annotation on any bean. If you give the wrong profile on that bean, that bean will give the bean creation or bean instantiation exception when you are trying in another profile. Also, you can use at the rate con conditional on property and other conditional annotation to configure bean based on specific property values. This allows you to fine tune the bean configuration based on different profiles. Also, our life becomes hell when unit testing becomes difficult. Now, suppose I want some properties to be picked up only during the testing and should be discarded after that. That can also be easily done using the test profile. So at the rate profile and give it as a test, that, prof that bean will only be created in a test scenario. I've already told you how to do that. Thus, you can achieve clear separation of concern, simple configuration management, having one DB configuration for local and development or different, complete different one for production. To be more adaptable to different environment, profile enables you to easily switch between configuration without modifying the code, promoting greater flexibility, maintainability of Spring Boot application. Now I have many more questions for 5 plus, 7 plus, like how to implement asynchronous processing, how to manage transactions in Spring Boot, how to handle cross origin, the role of actuator, how do you schedule a cron job or a task in Spring Boot. Many, many questions I have to cover with, with respect to Spring Boot with 5 plus. Then I also have many more trickier questions for 7 plus years of experience with how internal auto configuration works, how to override the default error handling, how to handle the wrong learning task without blocking the main thread and many, many things. 
So if you want me to cover the five plus and seven plus years of experience questions, you have to let me know in the comment section. Then only I'll create answers to this question, these questions that are commonly asked. So I'll be waiting for you in the comment section to help me decide whether five plus I should go next or seven plus, or even if you have a different topic in your mind like Kafka or something, just let me know in the comment section. The next video I'll create on the basis of your comments and request. Thank you.